Hey everybody, BTO Pro here. Today we're going to be talking about the future of the web. Via my own project. Obviously, I am building the future of the web completely unironically. So we are really talking about headless technologies, decoupled technologies. We're going to be providing a bunch of examples using my own projects as a backdrop for these things because they are all headless and decoupled. So this is a real industry thing, I promise. So it's also the thing that I've made largely. So <clears throat> topics for today, we're going to be revisiting, uh, not re yeah, revisiting, revisiting something in this class, never. We never go back and revisit things. So we're going to be revisiting flat file and static site concepts via Hacks CMS. Uh, we're going to be looking at some code internals, I'm also going to get into what is a headless CMS. What is this word headless? Brought it up many times this semester. Never defined it. Always say, hey, you're going to have to wait until that week where we talk about headless. Well, the week has finally arrived. So uh, we'll also look at something called JSON outline schema, which is a standard. Spacebar, spacebar, spacebar. That my team wrote that we use in things. It's standard we use. It's not like an industry standard or anything, but it's an interesting example. And we're going to um, dig into in-class activity and getting into the lab, which, as this is a recording on YouTube, you'll have to imagine that you're doing an in-class activity. You're not in class right now. So my bias alert here, obviously, I'm a little biased as to how these things work, how they're positioned in the marketplace, and my interest in them, because I'm, I'm writing them actively. This is to solve real-world problems my team has come across in working with faculty, students, staff members, other web developers, um, and just the industry in general. These are the types of solutions that can only come out of a very large moonshot type of project from academia. What I will be showing you and expressing has no market cap in today's marketplace. Because just because something can't print money doesn't mean it's not valuable. So uh, we're going to be looking at our course website, which is built on Hack CMS as well. And uh, you can always get involved with our project and join bit.ly slash hack slack. So a me alert. This is a bit of a deep dive into how my brain works. So this is logical to me. It's kind of unfolding and unfurling things going backward and forward in time and connecting concepts. Um, no class prepared me for what I'm about to show you or what I've worked on. Uh, what I've envisioned these last like five years now that I've been slowly morphing every ounce of effort I can towards it. It's just raw output and messing with an idea and wanting it to exist desperately in the world that needs it. So if you look at it, the, uh, there's like a snowflakey thing and it's back there in the background. Um, that's kind of the way my brain ends up working with these things. It's a network diagram. It's also the Elms Learning Network snowflake because all courses are unique, all individuals are unique and we think of things in, and view them through a unique lens. So this is a, gonna be a weird way of stepping through this stuff. So just putting it out there. So potential resume bullet points, decoupled and headless development, absolutely. Uh, we're gonna be at least mentioning what Swagger and the open API specification are. Very cool abstract connotation and does some very powerful things at scale. We'll be looking at JSON API, JSON schema briefly, and then make sure that you've got the ink wet on your pen so that you can go through and write down, why yes employer, I understand what hacks is. No, it's not a real thing for a resume, but I have seen people put it on a resume before, so never hurts. Um, so there, as I said, there's no direct market cap here. This is largely one of my vision type of projects for attempting to transform some aspect of society. So this is not about make a product and get it out there. We're gonna make the next Wix or Wix space or whatever the hell it is. No, this is about creating a revolution in the way that people express themselves online. Not necessarily like, you know, the French Revolution that this <laughs> GIF is riffing over here, but about a revolution in web technologies, the way they're developed, the way they're deployed, the way people can express themselves on the internet and the transparency and free flow of that information, no matter technical capability. That is revolution, and that is worth way more to me than money. 
So refresher on JSON. We got to go way down the well before we can get to our revolution built on brackets. <laughs> so JSON is short for JSON object. JavaScript and object notation. Sorry, JSON is short for JSON. The most common way to handle data in JavaScript. Pro tip, if you're writing JSON, go to jsonlint.com, some service like that. Just says, yep, this is valid. Or nope, you missed some random semicolon 40 miles down into this thing. And it'll point out where it is. Also, getting the JSON formatter plugin for Firefox or Chrome, big help. So we recall this is a JSON blob. We've got our attributes on the side on the left side here of this data array, or data object rather. And then the value over here, right? So this, can, these can be nested, so then we have nested objects of data. And you can pull this open in the console, hit anything you want. In this case, this is HackCMS. So if you go to our course site, right click, inspect, hit console, you can type window.hackCMS, and it'll start auto-completing with all of the objects that live underneath there. Some of those objects could be functions. You see this is a function callback, or it could be a reference to a DOM node. It could, it could be a number. It can be a string, literally anything. So resuming from last week, backwards, uh, hacks is a singular web component that knows how to edit other things inside of it. Here we see this little animated GIF, definitely not on Rails and intentionally illustrating the good parts that work. Um, it allows you to take building blocks of the web, web components, and wire them up visually into an editing experience so that you can leverage those tags to solve problems and portray yourself online without understanding what any of it is. All of this stuff we discuss, all these technologies, they're never for us. They're so we can build experiences for other people that otherwise would never understand these concepts we're discussing. So you can check these out at hacks.psu.edu. We've got multiple IST students contributing to it and other majors for that matter. Um, and you're more than welcome to jump in. This is an open community. We always need contributions from everybody. So hacks is ultimately a web component, H hyphen A hyphen X, which can edit things inside of it. So it's a web component that knows how to edit other web components. <clears throat> it is a next generation WYSIWYG, or what you see is what you get, but it's literally what you see is what you are getting because it is HTML, or quotes HTML, building blocks of the web. Those just happen to be custom building blocks that can do whatever the hell they want. So it's built with web components, saves its output to HTML, works across platforms because that's where web components work. And its goal is to empower all web properties, not just special ones, not just ones where people paid a lot of money for them, not just ones highly integrated into a certain context or with a ton of developer knowledge, any platform. This solves common accessibility issues at scale. I didn't say helps address. No, solves because we're able to rewrite the nature of how HTML works, we can solve common accessibility gotchas, not just account for them. This is focused on instructional designers and faculty um, on educating. It's to refocus them, rather, uh, instead of learning HTML or learning how to structure things in a document. There are conferences where faculty and staff are taught bootstrap class structure so that they can more nicely present material to students in a learning management system. Multiples. That's insane. Why are you learning HTML? You don't need to know HTML to put yourself on the internet, except you do right now. Uh, it's also lock-in free, migrate away at any time. It's just a text editor. It's just manipulating DOM structure, and that DOM structure lives and is free of hacks. You don't need hacks to be working with this for all time. You could pull content in or a table, edit it in place, spit it back out as HTML, copy and paste somewhere else, and it'll work there. And you can extend hacks by building visual assets, aka web components. So the idea is that we build other web components to solve use case problems that are visual in nature. They could also be non-visual, but we'll just stick to visual. And then hacks can be taught how to edit that component. The component should work by itself. We don't want there to be a whole series of like hacks fill in the blank blocks. It has lots of integrations with existing uh, content management systems and, and platforms, right? So we've mentioned Drupal in the past in this course. And so the idea would be that there's the block editor mode in Drupal and I'm ultimately just modifying that body field, but I'm dumping in whatever I want visually. Or WordPress, 
but not Gutenberg, which is doing the blocks portion of WordPress, right? So unlike Gutenberg, where it's saving out these little weird brackety things that would sort of look the right way without Gutenberg or without WordPress, you'll never migrate this away from WordPress. Don't kid yourself. It saves HTML. So we're ultimately outputting HTML, even if that HTML has the complexities of web components, right? If I have a custom web component tag there, like a video hyphen player, I can load in the definition of video hyphen player, and that content is agnostic of where it was just produced. So why I mention all this, Hacks is powered by JSON, a lot of it. And so it actually gets all of its directions from something we call App Store. The App Store is what's feeding the Hacks editor as to what its instructions are, what it can connect to, what types of web components to import, what all the web components are, things like that. In this preview area over here, I've inspected uh, an XHR or uh, a JavaScript based request that happens at runtime. I'm looking for the word app because I know that's what the name of it is. And there's a thing called generate app store. In there I can preview and see that things like date card, a code sample, citation element, hero banner, this stuff is being loaded in via JSON and telling the hacks editor, these are the tags you can put on your interface which we then see them start to show up here, right? Like hacks logos here, because in this JSON blob, hacks logo was told to load. So speaking of headless, what does hacks stand for? It's short for headless authoring experience. So what does that mean? Well, hacks requires a specification called App Store. As I mentioned, you can go right and read about it, document it quite a bit. Uh, the App Store tells hacks what elements it's allowed to edit. So hacks doesn't know what it's gonna edit until runtime. So page reloads, hacks tag is there, load the definition. Hacks tag says, oh, you told me to load this JSON file, loads it in and says, oh, what elements are we editing? Oh, these 50 or whatever. So that is headless. It's getting its directions headlessly from some backend of some kind. It's not doing pre-work ahead of time and then output and oh, now I know the elements. It's also not encoded directly into the hacks editor. By default, the hacks editor knows how to edit like heading tags, I think. Um, very low level concepts. So <clears throat> it could work without calling a backend. So it's headless then in that way as well. But the elements then tell hacks how to edit them. So this is a unique being in the universe of these things. If you were to make Guten blocks, you are specifically making components that work in Gutenberg. If you are making hacks blocks, not what we call them, but let's say they're called hacks blocks that you are making something that is designed by itself that works anywhere, it is free of the hacks editor. And then you're adding in a single callback called hacks properties. So it's a function that lives or method that lives off of your object called hacks properties and says, hey, if hacks is, is here, here is a way to build a form to, uh, to connect to it. And it's a JSON blob. So this hacks properties object is a little JSON blob. It's an abstraction of JSON schema that basically says, put a field here, it's gonna fill in this property in my, in my element. So this allows design assets to explain to hacks how they work, which means the assets can be repurposed, hacks can or can't, can't you know, doesn't have to be there. So it makes it headless on both sides actually. So what that looks like, we get this little JSON blob that helps inform things. So in this case, we're looking at a Twitter hyphen embed tag. So this is gonna embed some tweets. Now you can dig into what hack schema is more, I've got two examples here, but they fundamentally boil down to something like this. So there's Gizmo and Gizmo says, well, on the interface, when we put that little button as to what blocks we can add, this one's called a Twitter embed. So it says title Twitter embed. It also has a description. It's got an icon, which is how it has a little meme button there as an icon. Then under settings, we say uh, configure. So when we build the configuration form, what we're gonna put in there is an attribute called tweet. So that's the attribute to change in the element. But the title is gonna say tweet URL and the input for the user is gonna be a text field. So that's enough information that when that element is put on the page and we click it to activate it, Hacks goes, hey, hey what's your form? It bubbles up this message, renders out the, the field that says tweet URL and it's a text field. And then whenever you change is gonna update the tweet attribute internal to that element and you'll see it happen. So this is built on top of a technology called JSON schema. It's kind of a way of making uh, forms out of API driven data. I'm not gonna go super deep on it, but it is a really powerful 
very simple specification. So as a result of this, of things being built on this schema and abstraction of a spec and using this course, to be perfectly honest, we've been able to build content starting in 2017. We started prototyping with hacks that still works today, even though the interface looks radically different throughout that progression. So we see in 2017, we've got this panel that has certain things I could put on the interface. We've got this wrapper that's implying, hey, this is the thing you're working on. It's got some buttons to interface with it. We also played around the idea of self-editing elements. In this case, you could have this card and the card would know what the editing experience is very early on stuff. And this is actually showed in Drupal because we envisioned at first hacks only would work in Drupal, which isn't really headless or useful. But go to 2018, we kept refining this, kept working on this uh, JSON schema, but still built on top of web components. And so we've got a different interface for the bar. Our bar is up here, it's out of the way. Things in context still have an in-context menu to modify them. We have the a panel that would open up and it would say, here's the stuff that you can edit, right? So this is where like that Twitter embed button would be. And then we've got an idea of, well, where do you wanna put stuff? So we started to introduce using this headless concept for backend technology, right? So that I could actually drag and drop an image onto the interface and Hax's app store could say, oh, you have an image, uh, it should be saved here and just send it to the backend and then bring back a URL of where it saved it and put an image in the page. To 2019, cleaning up more, having this panel where you worked on the thing outside of in context, right? And then even later in the year, changing some of the colors around. But these are all highly traceable, all able to build out websites as we move along, even though the interface changes radically because of web components and because we're treating everything like it's an API. So we arrive at 2020, and if you've used Hacks up PSU ADU in the time that this is recorded, it would look like this. Much more cleaned up, consolidated, editing interfaces all in one panel. You can modify things in context. It's looking very clean. And I'm very happy to say that the 2021 version, which is actively in development that you are all going to contribute to now, looks like this. So it's even more cleaned up and refined based on user feedback, right? So we're able to edit things in context. We're able to have a lot of screen real estate back and focus on the parts of editing this that we care about. Way more accessible than past versions. Really nice looking. And this is all because of the work we've been able to do in these courses. So the next steps for hacks, definitely we're in a refinement, accessibility, and UX iteration mode. We're constantly cleaning up little things, doing minor UX feedback on individual elements to say, oh, do the field names for this Twitter embed make sense? Right? We want those elements to look awesome, but we also want the UX of a brand new user that's never looked at hacks before to be like, oh, oh yeah, I do want to embed a tweet and I know exactly what that means, right? That's a very hard thing to pull off. So we're in refinement mode. Uh, so we're improving all those assets, what their wiring is. Also working on documentation, our community website, um, and the platform, the Hack CMS platform in general, and internationalization, or IATM. So all of these are areas that students can help learn by doing and help us grow. This project is massive in scope and complexity, and we're trying to solve it using very low-level APIs, things that are built in JavaScript, HTML, and CSS that are standards you can take with you and apply to any other profession going forward as a developer. So as long as it's on the web, working and contributing to hacks is gonna benefit you long-term and it's gonna benefit us short-term to get you trained up in fixing these because it's a huge project. We have other, th there's always other stuff to focus on. So I did mention at the end there, internationalization, if you're unfamiliar with I18N, which is what that's short for, I18N, uh, I wrote about recently, but actually the way we're handling internationalization is also headless. Um, it's a unique way of handling it based on the review of options. In that article, I actually go through four other uh, conventions for how you could go about pulling this off as that led us to the one that we used. So highly recommend checking that out if you get a minute. So shifting gears, let's, I mentioned Hack CMS. We didn't really say what Hack CMS was, so what Hacks is. So Hack CMS is a Hacks editor, so headless authoring experience plus a content management system. So uh, it's a flat file system where you can touch and edit the files after the fact. 
is driven by a standard called JSON outline schema, which helps render the interface. Um, it's also headless. Uh, its front end is entirely made out of web components. And it uses the hacks editor to take that HTML area. And when you hit save, it basically takes the HTML, stuffs it in a .html file. Then when you would go through and you load a page in the interface, if you've used the course website at all, it recalls what that HTML file is. But it is still an HTML file. You could go and modify it. So it has a folder structure because it's a kind of like a static site system, flat file, right? And so the course website is actually driven this way. So you can find like the directions for this lab, for example, at github.com slash BTO pro slash IST 402. And you'll be able to look through pages, which is where Hack CMS stores all of its page material and find a flat index.html file, right? Because the course website is driven by these static files. However, when you view it in the course website at this long address, what you'll end up seeing is if you inspect and we do XHRs, we're actually loading in just the HTML content you're viewing on the fly. So the rest of the user interface is web components and it's driven and, and pretty intense data layer using something called MobX for state management, which we won't get into. But whenever you pick between these different links, it's gonna go and make a request for just the HTML in place. So static site generator, going way back now, take files based on location, file system, and run a job. Typically, this isn't like a data or a pages location for content. So there's a folder structure that has menu structure intentionality. Page and content is typically in like a markdown or an HTML format. It has front matter if it's a uh, markdown file. Um, so it has YAML at the top that basically informs like, Hey, this is a page of HT of Markdown. So when you load it up, it should be Markdown. However, there's also like the title, right? So you could store data along with it. So it's a generator uh, to build a website using a file system as a pattern, right? Now, what's a flat file system CMS? Uh, so a flat file CMS is data structure is saved to and recalled directly from the file system. Typically, each page is modified as a single file on the file system. So anything you do through the user interface or just editing files has a direct reflection. We're not talking about a database. There is no database here. And the idea of shipping or uh, handing off an entire site is as easy as pushing up a GitHub re a Git repo or I could download a thing as a zip and I can give it to you. So Hack CMS has kind of a hybrid of these things. So it has a folder structure, but you really need a lot of examples in order to understand it, I think. So there's hackstheweb.org. Menu, content, pages load. It looks very different from hacks.camp, which is what our event site is. It has lots of web components loaded in context for all the different attendees. But if you want something that looks really different, you can check out odl.science.pci.edu. This is a custom hack CMS theme, but it's driven by the same fundamental technology setup and flat files, all web components all the way down. Or if you want it, something else that looks weird and is poorly designed, because I just never get around to fixing it, um, btopro.com has one of these, is one of my blogs. But there's a lot of courses at the university that use this technology now. Uh, Physics 212, We've got Astro 130 with a different design. We've got Chem 202. We've got Biology 110, right? All of this is loading off different flat file structures, but I'm trying to illustrate that we can make that look radically different while still feeling really fast. So obviously our course website, past course, and current course website. So it's a headless course website. This material is loaded in headlessly. and as I think maybe again with the like pattern and like everything coming back together, you keep using this word. I do not think it means what you think it means. Headless, never once defined headless. We are like 11 weeks into the semester. I've mentioned the word multiple times. So let's define it finally. Headless web development or sometimes known as decoupled. So JavaScript loads JSON and HTML based paths. Pages reload and routing, which is a front end concept of like, where are we right now, helps by requesting individual pieces of content as opposed to a full on reload. So imagine if you go to top level website, you know, the university, anything else you can think of, and you click and it goes thinking and it loads. And then you click the next one, it goes thinking and it loads, right? And you might even get like a full, like page goes away, page comes back. That's a full page reload. That means the page was 
processed and rendered on the server, sent back to you. Your browser then loads the next page. Well, what we do in headless or decoupled development is you load all that stuff initially, then I click to go to the next page, and it makes an AJAX call to the back end and says, yeah, what should be replaced? Oh, the content, and just replaces the content area or just replace it and updates the menu, or just changes an icon, or whatever the thing is, the front end is completely in charge of this transaction. It is dictating to the back end, hey, give me some data, as JSON, typically. Pulls that JSON in, loads and changes things on the front end, and then has an experience for the user. Now, the, you'll see the URL update whenever you go to the course website, that's routing. So if you go to a different path, it's gonna change. Now, if you would hit refresh, You'll see the loading screen. It'll do a full-on reload. It'll get that page at the exact point in time. But all of it's happening on the front end unless you actually fully reload what's going on. So this allows front-end development teams and back-end development teams to work more cleanly. There's this contract almost between the way they communicate. Um, they need an API, and usually that's using JSON to serve it up between the two. So you can see this happening. You can also see it doesn't have to send JSON necessarily. So if you right-click the course website um, and hit, hit inspect, then hit the network tab and you can filter uh, based on request to XHR and you reload the page or you click to other pages, you'll see it makes a call to the content of the next page and just puts that content in place. So only the content is being sent across in that index. It's not the full rendered site. It's just the thing to change. So that's headless. Now, if you were to reload the whole site, you'll see additional calls go out the door. But I want you to go and inspect uh, site.json is the call we're looking for as an XHR. This is effectively the structure of the whole website. So it's a static file, or it could be served up from an endpoint, but it's a static file that has this data structure we call JSON outline schema. And inside there, if we unpack what the items are in this case, we can see things that look like a page, right? There's slug, that's the part of the address to update or the route. There's the title, which is what title to put on the interface. And there's, hey, here's where the data is stored. So you can go get the content of this page. And there's some other metadata as well. So JSON outline schema is a standard way of expressing the relationships between pieces of content in a simplified array format. So JSON, it's JSON based and it's an, the easiest way possible that we could find to express a menu of items. So it's the relationship between items in a menu more or less, which is pretty much what any site is anyway, right? If you have content that's in multiple menus, that's kind of just content that's at the top level and then other content that's at a different top level or content is in the header menu and this content's in the main menu. So then you have a non-visible item that's header and one that's main, and then stuff is hooked underneath there. So Hack CMS leverages this standard to uh, deliver an entire website. So from this little bit of data, we have a unique identifier of what the thing is. We have location of where to load the source, what to put in the URL so the user can get back to it. We have the parent is accounted for, so that's nesting. We have the title, and we also have other metadata, some stuff like sort order, things like that. But so if I shipped you three different elements or pages, one, the first page that says outline, right? It has an ID of item one, but then something that's nested under it could have parent item one, and this one has parent item one. And we have effectively three different menu items here. So they have their individual items, and the order helps inform that, well, these two items are under the same parent, this one goes first. Usually you go negative numbers up through positive as far as sort order. So that's enough data points to build this entire menu out and the hierarchy associated with it. And then when you click to different pages, we can update the content to load because we know what content to go uh, load for you. We know what the URL is to change. And if we have this structure loaded in, well, we know how to get to the next and the previous thing. So we know how to click and know what's the active item. We know how to get between different items. We know what the content is. That's enough to build any, any website, more or less. So anything that serves the JSON outline schema data model can talk to Hack CMS. Anything. Because it's headless. Just needs to be able to connect to that API. And so this is built off of another going back in time lab, uh, which was in, during our Drupal discussion. Uh, that we one of the options involved JSON API, which is a standard way of sending data just 
in a JSON format. It's a standard way of connecting to JSON in an API form. Um, there is a code pen that demonstrates this, the data coming from Drupal headlessly in JSON API format, which is JSON based. And then it's informing this user interface to just build these silly little cards. Right, and so this is a picture of what that looked like. This is JSON API format. However, it's basically just shipping a lot of data about the different nodes in a Drupal site. And so if we took that data from a Drupal site and instead we shipped it in a JSON outline schema format, we could power hack CMS using Drupal. So that's what this is an example of. So this interface right here is a course we actively run. It's a Beatles course. And so it's just, it's got some HTML that is our Drupal node content, right? It's a page of content, more or less flat HTML. Think of that body field in Drupal. If you remember that there's an area where all that stuff sits. And this interface is just fed a different JSON structure. It's not fed JSON API and it's not fed JSON outline schema. It's fed just the thing that powers this, right? So it's got some relationship data. It's very similar to JSON outline schema. Um, it's an older way we built this stuff. But it is in ultimately just you click, it's got the page, changes this, right? So we can serve custom JSON data feeds from Drupal pretty easily. So let's just serve a different data format. So what this little animation is gonna run through is that exact same content, but it's being requested from Drupal using Hack CMS's JSON outline schema format. And so this is still just HTML. There's still XHRs coming across the wire as I refresh the page. But we're getting this data from Drupal as opposed to, and there it is, JSON outline schema. There's hundreds of nodes in there. And look how fast that thing loaded with the entire UI. That is loading up the definitions of hundreds of pages. And it's there. There's no magic. I didn't cache this ahead of time. It's because it's a very lightweight format. And then each individual page just renders the internal area of that page. This is way faster than what a, a normal Drupal site could be as one example. But it's also an example of the nature of decoupled and headless architecture. This is hack CMS and it's headless front end assets running off of a dynamic backend instead of a static uh, .json file. So pros of headless, this liberates front end and back from back end decision making. Uh, you have a documented API that kind of serves as a contract between the front end and the back end team, right? The front end team says, we're going to build out stuff this way. The back end team says, okay, we'll serve it up using this format. And the two can then know what the, the thing to connect to is. The back end team doesn't care what it looks like. They just care about serving up data. The front end team cares about getting that data, consuming it and making it look nice. So there's much clearer separation of concerns. The front end doesn't have to care about what the server we're deploying this on is. Uh, that helps with local development as well. And it also improves communication between these teams because each can focus on their strength. But if I have a pro slide, there has to be a con slide. So it's costly to build these things, very costly. Um, it require, I just mentioned multiple teams. Not everybody has that. It requires knowledge of front end development, which is its own monster. API development, which is its own monster, and backend and server infrastructure expertise, which is its own monster. You kind of need a unicorn to be able to manage this stuff. So it can extend project timelines. Um, and also I would question, are you really decoupled? So I mentioned there was a contract more or less set up. If the backend changes the data structure, the API changes, and then the front end breaks. If the front end changes the API needs, but doesn't change the API, it breaks still. So you're decoupled, but you still are tied to this contract. You still have to keep these things in sync. It just kind of clarifies these lines of, of separation. It doesn't really totally solve the problem. It just gives you new ones, but you know where to look. Um, so wrapping that up, uh, it increases complexity of data model teams. Um, I have talked to Drupal shops that have choked on these or they just instantly, the bill goes up. I only mentioned Drupal because of my past life and they one of the communities talking about headless web development uh, before others were, I think. So you need some very different skill sets. Um, and JSON is great for rapid prototyping. I've loved working in this way. Um, also, if you're interested in, in progressive web apps, this is more or less the direction everything's going. It's not these like monolithic giant render on the back end and output. Um, so you are gonna be future ready learning this stuff. 
So you need standards to help simplify development is basically what it comes down to. I mentioned you need to know API standards and da -da -da, we have open API to the rescue. So this is a standard in API development, a standard for how you can understand how to build out a backend given the front end constraints involved. And so sometimes you'll see this mentioned as Swagger. I think that was like the original name. Now it's kind of like that. I, I don't fully understand the relationship. It's like part of the organization that manages this. But Open API Spec is the name of the actual uh, specification now. So Open API Spec Solutions. You now imagine if we have. So I mentioned that little example. Hack CMS. Hack CMS talks to a JSON file structure a certain way, loads an interface. Hack CMS talks to some other backend but it's using the same API, so it doesn't care, ingests from Drupal, and now you've got the Drupal content. What if you could do that with like anything? So let's skip JSON outline schema, which is a very specific API solution, uh, and go more generic. So open API is a API for documenting APIs. So it's very meta. However, think of like a Drupal type solution that would help with managing that. That's where something like WSO2 comes into play. So I ran across, I've never seen this or heard about it anywhere else, but um, I ran across this at BYU and they were actually using this to remix hundreds of APIs together. Because if you have kind of this routing system, like almost think of like an old VCR or TV that you're plugging in all the inputs to connect older technology to it or something, that you have to have some routing capability that basically says, I don't care how you get it here, but it has to be sort of standard. And the you put the cassette tape in or 8-track or DVD or Laserdisc or whatever your use case that isn't a purely digital form to get a thing to broadcast to a television, whatever your example from your generation is. Use that. It plugs into the television or into the monitor or whatever, and it somehow gets the picture up there. Well, Open API is kind of that, and WSO2 is that like routing VCR technology. You can actually remix data together from multiple endpoints because the API is documented in a format that understands how to ingest from anywhere. If that didn't make any sense, don't worry about it. It's really, really complicated. However, Hack CMS can output this. So what it is, is it's a documented way of how to connect to Hack CMS and build a backend for Hack CMS in effect. So it says, uh, it's pretty easy. To, it looks more complicated than it is, honestly. But as long as you follow this it's schema and you say, okay, I've got paths, and then here's the path, right? And then I can perform a post or a get, like whatever an HTTP operation is. This is a tag for humans to read it. We'll see in a second why. And this is an operational ID of some kind um, so that we can nest these visually. And then what is the response code I'm expecting to get back? You can also include like what the inputs are and the outputs, things like that. But if you build out in this way, you can actually build a human user interface from it. So if you go to editor.swagger.io and you copy and paste the, the response of that URL into the Swagger editor, it will build a fully queryable interface of what all the endpoints are, what the input is for each of those, what to expect. You can actually then fill out those form fields and in certain situations, not with this thing specifically, but uh, like local development and stuff where you don't need authentication piece. You could actually test that the endpoints are giving you the correct response using this technology. It's awesome. So Swagger gets us the ability to tell other systems how to interface with this one, right? So think, try to think of it like this. If you implement Swagger and something can consume Swagger, then that something can learn how to interface with your application no matter what it is. Other developers could pick it up more easily too because it's built on an industry standard. So it's really good to adopt industry standard types of APIs. So looping back around to the whole static site thing. So hack CMS in a nutshell, because right, now I just mentioned a dynamic backend API generating thing. So it's a its files are static and run standalone. Okay, I can follow that. It can be put in version control as a result of this. That makes sense. It's headless and JSON powered. Okay. It uses JSON schema. Cool. So using standards. It's dynamically generating open API 3.0 endpoints. Uh, doesn't sound static. And it can be built on top of PHP, Chromium, Node.js, Beaker Browser, content management systems. Uh, what is going on? Because those don't sound static. And you said this was static. 
So I don't really, I I've kind of coined a phrase or attempt to say what this is. Doxify, I think, is the closest thing in the same neighborhood as this, as far as some of the weird things Doxify makes possible. But it's a hybrid static site generator. It's the best way I can, I can coin it. So coining that, it is a system that loads static markdown or HTML files that uses modern front-end tooling to manage them with JavaScript for its front-end, headlessly loads content, but tooling, no matter what that server tech is, must write back to a fully static form. Meaning that if there is no JS powering it and it's got all these endpoints to be able to save because you can actually you know, use the hacks editor, it has to save somewhere, it's not magic. So saving has to save back to a static file format. So this is a newer, I, I still haven't seen a ton of things that do this. Grav, Grav is basically doing this. You have a user interface, you do your editing and it's updating files that are static in nature. I'm hoping maybe this becomes more prevalent in the future, but I don't know. I, I really think we're kind of a weird unicorn at the moment. So anything that defines the endpoints uh, that it can talk to, right? That anything can be defined as an endpoint, hack CMS can sit in front of it, right? So um, if that backend though, rewrites those files, as I just mentioned before, right? It's got to save the data somewhere. So if it if it say, if you're editing a page in hacks and it saves to static content, and then you reloaded the page and you saw the same content. You go, oh, it, it served me the content. So you would kind of think it's dynamic, but really it's just saving to a static file and then you're seeing it. So it's almost like there's this interface of things that is doing that transaction. And this is because HackCMS has front end checks to see if there's something to write to. So if there's no back end or you're not logged in, it's just static content. So it's almost like the content comes to life to build out the editing interface knowing it has this more dynamic thing it can connect to. So for example, this is you going to the course website, but this is me going to the course website. And the only difference is I log in and it goes, oh yeah, you have the editing rights for this. Nothing else has changed. The front end does the same exact checks. It goes, oh, you don't have a JSON web token, which is a special security token that's generated whenever I log in. Now for your sites, you do. Now, as one last detour, if you want to do mashup hacks with 11 or it's actually more specifically hack CMS with 11 um, you can go this route and check it out. So this is taking hack CMS and abstracting 11 and basically making it use hack CMS as a render engine. Now, the reason for this beyond it's a cool experiment um, is that you end up with hack CMS pages loading very fast in between. So kind of like Doxify, Doxify is doing is loading the stuff dynamically. Um, However, you get the advantages of 11 static page generation technology, which means you can publish to GitHub pages branches easily. Uh, it also means you have high SEO because that is static content that's ripped there. And there's no backend processing language that's required, which is neat in order to achieve that. Usually you do need something dynamic to do that high SEO aspect. So you can learn more about that. There, it has the hack CMS folder structure, but then it tacks on this content folder. And the content folder is basically just fully rendering and smashing together the design layer with the content itself. So you actually see the content in the output of the site. Uh, it still has the pages structure though, right? And these are the headless endpoints for information, except they're stored as markdown files. And so they load up the markdown file. You can work on it locally. You could just edit the markdown file or you could use the hack CMS editing interface locally because it's real trippy. Works either way. And then it compiles out to static files that have high SEO. It's pretty cool. So some futures with hack CMS. Um, we're gonna work more on the 11 build. Uh, PHP, Node.js and Drupal backends are there, but we definitely wanna clean up uh, visually the way they're documented as well and how nice those integrations happen on the front end. So I think we're gonna get into more headless CMS integrations in the future. I've also said for God, probably two years that we have plans to work on a desktop app via Electron. So I'm going to probably start turning that over to a, just a dedicated student project in the near future. But that's all a small team of people are going to work on is this desktop app um, to try and drive it forward. Because we've got the rest of the stuff in place that this is now possible for sure. So uh, goals with Hack CMS, web components all the way down, always going to be static files. I also want people to start anywhere, edit anywhere else, and deploy anywhere else. These decision trees 
should not be a thing of like, well, you built this site in Drupal and so it has X, Y, Z capabilities, or it has to be deployed over here on bare metal architecture that's high scale because of normal people don't think this way and they shouldn't have to. This should not be a, a lock-in type of situation. It's a damn web page. To just get up there and work, okay? So if we can have web components all the way down, if our theme layer is sufficiently abstract, if our data layer is abstract, if our design assets are just made aware of hacks and are ultra performant, that eliminates concerns of where that data is fed from. I don't care if you're logging into WordPress and editing content, but it's served up via hack CMS. That's one step closer to breaking free of that other aspect, right? So that you can just have self-expression full publishing capabilities, total creativity without any technical barrier whatsoever to get them out there. It also uh, leads directly into sharing and remixing OER, or open educational resources, which is a huge pain in the butt right now for a lot of people. So if you were in class, we would have had a class activity now. And so what we do for a class activity is we go through and do user testing and you work with a partner, but we don't have partners in an online space. So um, this has in the past led to these improvements through the Hacks user interface because of the semesters of this course. And so we're gonna extend that into this year. So basically we have people pick two tasks. One person talks, the other person writes down what it is. They use our demo server, which has the next version of Hacks CMS so we can improve it even more before we get it out the door. And so then just teeing that up more for people as to what your job is. You get credit when you post it into your lab notes. And there's no lab because this is a YouTube recording. But this would be the point to jump off and say, if you're interested in contributing to this project or any of our related projects or learning more about Hacks the Web, I suggest you go to hackstheweb.org. You can always join us on Slack at bit.ly slash H-A-X-S-L-A-C-K. That's Hack Slack. Uh, jump in, say hi, uh, you know, talk to some of the, the core contributors, learn about where the project's going. We're always looking for people to jump in. All of our code is open source. We've got hundreds and hundreds of web components that are open beyond just, you know, the Hacks uh, editor and our theme layer in, in Hacks CMS. So with that, catch you later. Learn something, learn something next time, YouTubes. <laughs>